This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video from the Denison Forum, which asks the question, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Which is honestly a more complicated question than it seems at first. Though really, I don't much care what a series of two to three thousand year old books have to say on the matter. Like yeah, maybe I would have a different opinion about them if they were actually the word of God, as is so often claimed. But given the number of demonstrably untrue things the Bible says, I'm just not convinced of that. So yeah, I'm not going to decide that something is right or wrong based on these books. But even if I did, there's a lot of nuance that can be found in the context surrounding the verses on homosexuality. Now, this may come as a surprise to some, but the books of the Bible were not originally written in English. And on top of that, modern culture was not the target audience for the authors of the Bible, so there might be some cultural things going on that they were addressing that we don't typically think of. Anyway, let's see how it goes. But first, a word from our sponsor, Surfshark. Hey Tim, nice to see you again. You look like you have a load on your mind, and why are you eating with your hand? Spoons are dirty. Yeah, I do have a lot on my mind. H have you thought about maybe doing the dishes? Oh, well, never mind. What's, what's up? Why do you have a load on your mind? Well, you know how for my other job I have to, like, review a bunch of really bad movies, and so I have to watch them first in order to make the reviews? That sounds horrible. I'm sorry, man. It's worse than you know. Yeah? I've watched so many terrible movies that my Netflix search algorithm is just all messed up. Like now when I want to actually look for something good to watch, it thinks that I want to see something like Benji Shapiro and the tarot reading that will change your life or some nonsense like that. It's just the worst because they base your recommendations off of your search history and my search history is just garbage. Tim, I, I feel like we've been over this a couple times already, you know, like back in January. And then again in February, and now again in March. Is this going to be like a once a month thing? Do you mean Surfshark VPN? It can help me with this problem too? Oh yeah. Surfshark allows you to surf the internet anonymously by masking your IP address and location, and thereby allowing you to access 3,200 servers across 100 different countries. You can even get access to Netflix US or Netflix UK, which have different movies than they do in Canada. Surfshark VPN allows you to browse privately and encrypts your internet activity so that no one can steal your data. It allows you to use public Wi-Fi while staying safe from online threats. You can use it to get better prices by changing your geographical search location, and it can block ads, viruses, and malware. Tell me more about this magic. It's not magic, Tim. Surfshark is easy to use, easy to install, and it works with all mobile devices as well as computers. Plus, you can use an unlimited number of devices on the same account with no extra fees. I mean, that sounds pretty cool, but like, how do I get started? For a limited time, listeners can get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deals slash rhino. Enter the promo code rhino for 83% off and three extra months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out. Thanks, Rhino. I use Surfshark VPN to mask my online activities, and you should too. Hey, I've got an idea. Yeah? You should come and watch an awful movie with me. That could be fun. After I install Surfshark VPN, of course. Oh. Great. My uncle is a homosexual. And he, knowing that I'm a believer, has come to me many different points. Mm -hmm. Uh, and ask me different questions such as, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? What does it say about me getting married? Things like that. Well, uh, let's give them a bit of credit here. Usually in these stories it's the Christian initiating the conversation. These guys manage to avoid looking like jerks, for now, because the gay person is asking them for their input, instead of it being him asking how he can deal with the fact that his uncle is gay when his gay uncle isn't actually doing anything that requires him to deal with it. Now. Is this actually how it happened? Press X to doubt. But since that's how he's presenting it, I don't get to use my usual opener for these types of videos where I can tell him to just mind his business. Uh, I find it hard to respond to him. The only reason that would be hard is if you're actually worried about the nuances of the verses that talk about homosexuality, or are yourself a Christian who is accepting of homosexuality, and so struggles with interpreting the verses that condemn it. So there's a bit more evidence that this story is mostly performative rather than an accurate representation of something that actually happened. How do I respond to him from, in a loving way, because I love him, um, while also not condoning mm -hmm. 
those actions. And there's your problem right there, thinking that your opinion should even matter in this scenario. He's probably not looking for you to be his romantic partner, so your approval or disapproval of his sexuality is completely irrelevant. I mean, I guess if you guys have a good relationship, he might care about the fact that you disapprove so strongly of a part of him that he didn't choose and cannot change, and so he might be hurt by that fact. In which case, no matter what you say, your refusal to accept him for who he is, is going to hurt. Stephen, that's really the issue. Uh, I appreciate you personalizing that. I understand that for your own family, this is very, very personal and intimate as a question. And uh, it's an issue for so many people. It's really hard to find somebody who hasn't been touched in a personal way. Come on, man, phrasing. These supposedly accidental euphemisms happen in Christianity so frequently that I'm pretty much convinced at this point that they do it on purpose to generate reactions. Come inside me, Lord Jesus, show me your power, enter me and fill me with your glory. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Like, they have to know, right? There's no way that they don't know. It's a very complex issue, as you would know. I've written uh, uh, very long chapters and books on this specific subject. and Which really speaks volumes. I mean, literally, actually, in this case. <laughs> Like, this topic is actually a really easy one if we're not obsessing over what the ancient Hebrews thought about it. You ready for me to address it in as much detail as it needs to be addressed? Here it is. If you don't like the idea of being gay, then don't be gay, and don't concern yourself with the sexuality of anyone that isn't a potential romantic partner for you. That's it. That's all there is to it. We have uh, papers on our website that get into this in much greater length than we have time for in this brief conversation. You shouldn't need time here. Hell, even granting your weird obsession with what the ancient Hebrews thought about homosexuality, the answer is still easy. Keep it to yourself. You still don't have to be gay. You don't even have to approve of other people being gay. But you can just shut the fuck up about it. Do what Jesus said, and judge not, lest ye be judged. Hell, if we look at Romans 12.20, then even if you think that it is evil or wicked to be gay, and you think of LGBTQ people as enemies, it explicitly says to be extra kind to them. I mean, the motivation there is yikes as fuck. The whole for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head bit looks like it says that the nicer you are to someone who ends up in hell, the worse their torment in hell will be. Keep that in mind next time you hear a preacher talk about loving your enemies. Maybe they're not thinking about this verse when they say that, but the existence of this verse means that there exist people who do nice things for other people that they consider to be their enemies, specifically to make their afterlife torture worse. And this is literally in a section of the Book of Romans that is supposed to be describing how you can tell that someone is a true Christian. Apparently, one of the marks of a true Christian is that they do good things for their enemies because they know that that will cause them greater harm in the long run if they don't. So petty vindictiveness. That actually tracks, now that I think about it, kind of matches God's personality. The first point I would make is that the Bible consistently tells us that God does not intend us to live in same-sex relations. The Bible also consistently says that if you are circumcised, then you are required to obey the whole of the law. No forgiveness through Christ for you. In the Old Testament, circumcision was the mark that showed that you were part of the covenant with God, which included the law. Then in Galatians 5, Paul says, If you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole of the law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. So the Bible is consistent in stating that you have to follow the law if you are circumcised. And yet many Christians still choose to circumcise their babies, effectively condemning them to hell, according to this passage, unless they start doing animal sacrifices again. So why are we worried about what the Bible consistently says about homosexuality when we're not worried about what it consistently says about circumcision? That's in the Old Testament, that's in the New Testament. That's Leviticus 18, Leviticus 22, Deuteronomy 23, but you also find that in Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, and 1 Timothy 1. Let's start with the New Testament one, since the Leviticus and Deuteronomy verses are in the middle of massive law codes that modern Christians are happy to almost completely ignore. Like, Deuteronomy 23 also has a verse that forbids Ammonites, Moabites, and anyone with crushed testicles or cut off penises from entering the assembly of the Lord. Racism and discrimination against disabled people are written into the law, right there where you're cherry-picking a verse that, when we get to it, isn't even about homosexuality anyway. 
OK, back to the New Testament. Romans 1 is one where we need to look at the cultural context. In the Roman world, homosexuality was not looked at the same way as it is today. It was thought that everyone could be sexually satisfied in heterosexual relationships, and so to seek out homosexual partners was to exhibit overly lustful behavior. So when it says that they exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and were consumed with passion for one another, that isn't a condemnation of monogamous homosexual relationships, that is a condemnation of being consumed by lust. And we can see this because it's not talking about people that were looking for exclusively homosexual relationships, it explicitly states that they are giving up the natural, read heterosexual, relationships in order to pursue homosexual sex. In this context, it's rather obvious that this is a condemnation of lust rather than of being gay. Also, the idea that homosexuality is unnatural is one of the many errors in the Bible, as homosexual behavior happens all the time in nature. In fact, finding animals that exhibit same-sex mating behaviors is far easier than finding ones that don't. It's possible, lightly even, that the evolutionary origin of same-sex mating behavior goes back to the evolution of sex itself. Because in the first organisms to sexually reproduce, it's unlikely that the males and females were differentiated enough to easily distinguish which is a mating partner and which is not. And so the reproductive advantage went to the individuals that would mate with any member of the same species, regardless of sex, than those who would hold out for an opposite sex partner that they might not even recognize as opposite sex. Back to the Bible verses, 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Timothy 1 use a Greek word that is not known to exist in any other Greek texts. Those two verses are the only two uses we have of that word anywhere. And up until 1946, it was never translated as homosexual. Now, it is a compound word that is made up of the Greek words arson and koiti, I'm probably mispronouncing those, I apologize, which mean male and lying, respectively. And these are, in fact, the words that are used in the two verses dealing with homosexuality in Leviticus. So let's take all three of these verses kinda together. The main objection to them being used against homosexuality is that the translation should be something along the lines of a man who lies with a male, which could be interpreted as a prohibition of the act of pederasty rather than homosexuality. Now, that mostly applies to the New Testament passages rather than the Old Testament ones, because despite the New Testament ones making use of a compound word that was made up of words found in the Old Testament passages, there are some contextual nuances that make the Leviticus passages a bit different. For instance, if we look at the phrase uncover nakedness as it is used in Leviticus, it usually means sex. You're not allowed to uncover the nakedness of your father's sister, she is your father's relative. In other words, don't have sex with your aunt. There are two places, though, where this euphemism does not seem to hold true. Verse 7 and verse 14 of Leviticus 18. In all other instances, uncover nakedness clearly refers to having sex with the person whose nakedness you are uncovering. But in those two verses, it changes the meaning to be something more like having sex with the wife of the person whose nakedness you are uncovering. And what's more, the only two verses where the gloss about uncovering nakedness changes the meaning of the verse are the ones that deal with men. That is, if the gloss did not change the meaning, the prohibition would be against sex with specific men. Verse 7 is, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother, you shall not uncover her nakedness. And verse 14 is, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. That is, you shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. Because the only two verses that change the meaning of uncovered nakedness are the ones that, if they did not change the meaning, would have wound up prohibiting specific homosexual acts, it can be inferred that there was some editorializing going on with Leviticus, and that it originally did not prohibit homosexuality in general, by virtue of the fact that it prohibited specific incestuous homosexuality. After all, why would you need to explicitly state that having homosexual sex with a male relative is forbidden, if all homosexual sex is forbidden anyway? Now, supporting this conclusion, it's also been pointed out that the original Hebrew wording of Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13 use a phrase that is never found in the same form anywhere else in the Bible, and English translators have a tendency to add words into their English translations that don't appear in the Hebrew. When examining the specific words used, their contexts, and which contexts they tend to be used in in other places in the Bible, a literal translation would be something more along the lines of, and with a male you shall not lie down the lyings of a woman. Now, 
to come back to the phrase that is never found elsewhere, it's the bit at the end that was translated as the lyings of a woman. Now, we do have a couple hints about how this should be translated elsewhere in the text. For instance, the word translated as lyings is only used in its plural form in one other spot in the Bible, Genesis 49, 4. And in what context do we find this? in the context of Reuben sleeping with his father's wife, an act that is forbidden by the incest laws found earlier in Leviticus 18. There is some similar contextual stuff going on with the word woman there, and when we take all of this into account, in conjunction with the fact that the anti-homosexuality verse in chapter 20 is smack dab in the middle of the incest section rather than a few verses after it as in chapter 18, it seems as though these passages are talking about homosexual incest rather than homosexuality in general. And so a more proper translation when we don't do the word-for-word -word literal thing but actually try and figure out the meaning of the verse should be sexual intercourse with a close male relative should be just as abominable to you as incestuous relationships with female relatives. As a way of emphasizing after those incest passages that not all of the potentially incestuous relationships were explicitly forbidden, but it can be taken as a rule that homosexual incest is just as forbidden forbidden as heterosexual incest. And finally, we come back to Deuteronomy 23, which isn't even a prohibition on homosexuality, but a prohibition on male and female cult prostitutes. Sure, some translations use the word sodomite in place of male cult prostitute, but it's literally the same word that is translated as female cult prostitute earlier in the verse, just the masculine form instead of the feminine form. So this one is actually pretty clearly not about homosexuality. And the only reason that I'm even going into this amount of detail here is to point out that if you do, for some reason, actually care about what a bunch of ancient Hebrews thought about homosexuality and need to know their opinion on it before you can form your own, it actually turns out to be rather ambiguous. None of what I have said here is 100% certain. Some of the arguments I've made here are stronger than others, but none of them are conclusive. And that includes the arguments in favor of anti-gay interpretations as well. So what this really comes down to is the fact that it is entirely plausible to interpret the Bible in an LGBTQ-friendly way, and your insistence on choosing an anti-LGBTQ interpretation demonstrates the fact that you are merely a bigot, using religion as a shield to make yourselves more socially acceptable. Don't hide behind your religion. It could go either way. Just own the fact that you are a bigot. Oh shit, I better make sure they're not in Florida before I say that, or I might end up having to pay $35,000 in defamation damages that, you know, Florida's trying to pass that law. Because, you know, the party of free speech loves nothing more than making sure that free speech only applies to speech that they like. Oh good, he's in Texas. I'm safe until Texas decides to copy Florida. Also, Ron DeSantis is a bigot. Whoopsie, that just slipped out. Some that would say that's an outdated uh, dietary requirement like kosher law or something like that. And in speaking specifically about the old laws that forbid homosexuality, which are the ones that include the kosher dietary restrictions, the author of Hebrews said, and I quote, In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. The new covenant with Jesus means that the entirety of the old covenant is ready to vanish away, no longer being relevant, being obsolete. Again, to quote the author of Hebrews, if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. This pretty clearly states that the Old Testament law does not apply to Christians. Unless they're circumcised, of course, then Jesus doesn't apply, and they better hope to God yeah, that they are good at avoiding mixed fabrics that it's an Old Testament outdated legalism, that's just not true. So why do you disagree with the Bible about the relevance of the Old Testament? And if we can't discard the old law, how do we decide which parts of it to follow and which ones we do get to discard? Do you think that period sex is a crime that requires those who commit it to be cast out from society? Because that comes from the same section as one of the verses that you said still applies about homosexuality. Also, that particular verse, the one in Leviticus 20, doesn't stop at homosexuality as an abomination. It also says that anyone who has homosexual sex should be put to death. So my question here is, are you selectively ignoring the part of the verse that says they should be put to death, their blood is upon them? Or are you advocating for the genocide of LGBTQ people? You can't have it both ways here. Either that part of your book is no longer applicable for one reason or another, or you think that this guy's gay uncle should be executed for being gay. Because every place the Bible speaks to it, it tells us not to engage in this behavior. And it says to execute those who do. So again I ask, please explain why you feel free to ignore the kill them part, but not the being gay is bad part. 
Again, you are cherry picking. This is yet another demonstration that you are using your religion as a shield for your bigotry, rather than you being bigoted because of your religion. New Testament as well as Old Testament. A second point some would say, uh, would argue, is that the Bible doesn't understand uh, consensual, monogamous, homosexual relations. I mean, I guess you could say that, but honestly, if that's your go-to, then I'd take it back to my initial question. Why do we even care what a bunch of ancient Hebrews thought about homosexual relationships in the first place? That what the Bible is forbidding is homosexual abuse or rape or incest or some such as that. That's not that the Bible doesn't understand homosexual relationships. That's just the fact that there is some nuance and interpretation room in the text, where the intentions of the original authors are unclear, and the best we can do is make educated guesses based on contextual clues, both from the verses in question and other verses where the same words are used. Since a plausible argument could be made both in support of and in condemnation of homosexuality, your decision as to which interpretation you choose says more about you than it does about the book. Well, the Bible certainly forbids that. You have the sin of Sodom in Genesis 19, for instance. Now that's a whole other can of worms. The sin of Sodom might not have even been anything to do with sex. It might merely have been the breaking of the rules of hospitality, but that's largely irrelevant. Regardless of the specific rule that the authors of the story think was being broken, I'm pretty sure we can all agree that an entire town full of men demanding access to visitors so that they can gang rape them is indeed morally wrong. But homosexuality was known to the ancient world. It was very much known in the Greek world and in the Roman world of the New Testament. It was even known to the Canaanites in the time of Moses. And yet the Bible consistently and unambiguously tells us that this is not God's best for us, that this is not God's intention for us. I don't think that anyone would argue that gay people didn't exist back then, or that those cultures were somehow not aware of their existence. They thought about them differently than we do today, sure, but that's not the same as thinking they didn't exist. So that moves to a third point. Why would the Bible forbid this kind of behavior, especially if your uncle were to say, God made me this way, or I didn't choose this lifestyle, I don't remember a time that I wasn't attracted to men, something like that, then is this God's fault and why would God condemn something that he created? Yeah, those are all good questions. Add on to that the fact that sexual orientation is determined as the brain develops in the uterus, and that basically all the evidence suggests that people like you, acting as though being LGBTQ is a sin, is dirty, deserves to be punished, is evil, wrong, depraved, and whatever other hateful labels you guys regularly apply to LGBTQ people, are actually exacerbating a plethora of mental health issues. Apologists often like to trot out the statistics to support the idea that being gay is harmful, saying that LGBTQ people have higher rates of mental health problems, all while ignoring the fact that the evidence strongly indicates that the source of most of these mental health problems are people like you, saying that it is wrong to have sexual orientations that they do not choose. Is a huge issue inside all this. Well, science has not settled and may never settle the nature versus nurture question here. I mean, not settled in the sense that brain development is a super complicated subject and pretty much nothing about it is ever 100% settled. That said, all of the evidence gathered over the past 20 to 30 years pretty conclusively links homosexuality with biology, genetics, in utero epigenetics, in utero hormone and protein exposure, and a bunch of other developmental factors that take place before the baby is born all play a part in determining both sexual orientation and gender identity. As far as brain science goes, the fact that sexual orientation is nature rather than nurture is just about as settled as it's possible for anything to be. The degree to which uh, sexual preference is inherited or it's determined by uh, your environment, it's determined by your experiences growing up, that, that will always be a question, I think. Well, you think wrong. You have to pretend like it's an open question with equal likelihood in either direction in order to avoid the fact that if sexual orientation develops in the womb, then it's God making people gay and then commanding them not to be how he made them. But no matter how hard you pretend, you're wrong. But just because a person has a proclivity to do something doesn't make that always the right thing for them to do. Yeah, on that point you're right. Now, let's see what the Bible has to say about straight marriage. 1 Corinthians 7 verses 8 through 9 says, To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Looks as though the good Christian thing to do is to remain single. But if you can't exercise self-control, that's when you should get married. So it's understood here that complete abstinence is preferable for everyone but concessions are made because it's also understood that the sexual urge is way too strong to keep it pent up in everyone. 
So for straight people, they get to marry so that they can have non-sinful kinds of sex. What about the people that God made gay? Surely some of them won't be able to exercise self-control if they aren't allowed to marry, and since it's better to marry than to not be able to exercise self-control, should they not be allowed to marry? And forcing a gay man to marry a woman, or vice versa, will not satisfy that urge, so they should be allowed to have a same-sex marriage so that they don't struggle with self-control. If you're going to say that it's okay to be gay as long as they can remain celibate, then unless you advocate the same for straight people, you are a hypocrite. Because the Bible tells straight people to remain celibate. But then, you know, it's understood that that's an unreasonable ask for everyone. Unless you're gay, then apparently becomes reasonable for everybody. You know, it's a terrible example in some ways by way of analogy, but we do know that there's a genetic predisposition toward alcoholism that some people for unfortunately have to wrestle with. Yeah. You're right, that is a terrible analogy. Because drinking alcohol is not an integral part of the human experience. Even if it were, excessive alcohol intake causes demonstrable harm. Hell, even moderate alcohol intake causes demonstrable harm, and I say this as someone who enjoys a few drinks on a fairly regular basis. But the world would be a better place if everyone stopped drinking altogether. The exact opposite is true of homosexuality. The attempt to suppress homosexual behavior among gay people leads to demonstrable harm, while allowing them to just live their lives leads to demonstrably better outcomes across the board. And now, just rewind the video a little bit and watch this segment again, but do a shot every time I say of some version of the word demonstrable. Yes, that one counts too. Well, we wouldn't come along and therefore say alcoholism is therefore appropriate for them, you know? Yeah, because of the outcomes. Now, first off, it's worth distinguishing between something that is caused by genetics and something that is caused by the development of the brain. There are plenty of factors that can affect how a brain develops that are not related to genetics, but are related to things like hormone levels, the presence or absence of certain proteins, epigenetic factors, and a whole host of other things. As the evidence accumulates regarding homosexuality, it has become abundantly clear that there is no one single gay gene. There are certain genes that can impact the likelihood of that person turning out gay, but they don't work alone. And the same goes for alcoholism, actually. There are a number of genes that are directly linked to alcoholism, but having those genes does not automatically make you an alcoholic. So rather than saying they're both genetic and we should treat one as a disease but treat the other as appropriate, that oversimplification misses the mark entirely. Hell, you could use that to say that we should treat people who have blue eyes as though blue eyes are a genetic disorder that needs to be treated. Their cause is genetic, after all. Okay, but does having blue eyes cause any harm? How does it impact their lives and ability to function as members of society? It doesn't. Now, if there was a religious organization that was constantly demonizing blue-eyed people, treating them like they're subhuman, and insisting that they wear colored contacts that make them look like they have brown eyes in order to fit in with the dictates of their thousands of years old holy book, then having blue eyes would have a negative impact on their lives. But it's not because of their blue eyes, it's because of how they are treated by the anti-blue-eyed bigots. Alcoholism, on the other hand, will cause harm to that person and their ability to function in society, regardless of how other people respond to it. Whether we accept it and allow them to constantly drink themselves silly with zero judgment, or whether we treat it as a genetic disorder that requires medical intervention, the alcoholism itself is the cause of several problems in their lives, ranging from health effects to social impact. I don't mean to compare homosexuality to alcoholism in that sense. Then don't. If you don't mean to do it, then don't do it. Nobody forced you to do that. Compare it to something that it's actually comparable to. Hell, even compare it to other preferences and attractions. Some people like the color green, others do not. There is some evidence to suggest that color preference is influenced by genetics. So if it turns out that color preference is entirely determined either genetically or in utero, then that becomes a pretty apt comparison. But of course, you can't compare it to something that is actually comparable, because then it becomes abundantly clear that any of the negative impacts associated with it are a direct result of people like you treating it like it's evil. Would we say that people who like green should go through life pretending to like blue, since the majority of trichromat individuals prefer blue hues over greens and yellows? No, that would be silly. Someone else's favorite color has no impact on you or your life, unless they are someone that you are planning on making a life with, and so will have to do things like choose what color to paint the various rooms of your home. The same applies to sexual orientation here. Unless they are someone that you are planning on having a romantic or sexual relationship with, their sexual orientation is none of your goddamn business, even if they are publicly flaunting it. 
If the person who prefers green wears a green shirt, should the people who prefer blue attempt to pass laws preventing the public display of green clothing, lest it offend their delicate sensibilities, and, heaven forbid, even expose children to the idea that different people have different favorite colors sometimes? If the children are exposed to this idea, then people having different favorite colors might become normalized. And then those kids, they might grow up feeling comfortable expressing their favorite color if it turns out to be different from the majority. And we can't have that, can we? Of course, this is completely ridiculous, but again, it's comparable. In fact, the evidence that color preference is biologically determined is significantly weaker than the evidence that sexual orientation is biologically determined. But most people, even Christian apologists, see how ridiculous it would be to write books and preach sermons about how your kids are all supposed to have blue as their favorite color. And if they don't, then we should send them to color preference conversion therapy so that they can learn to like blue best. So why would it be less ridiculous to assume that same thing, but about something that we have less control over than color preference? Uh, the fall affected all of us. Maybe, but according to your worldview, God knits everyone together inside their mother's wombs. So if someone comes out of the womb already gay, then that's how God chose to make them. And that leads to three practical statements I'd want to make. First, we're all broken sexually. What does it even mean to be broken sexually? Certainly there are people that have trauma that's associated with sex, and as a result are unable to enjoy the act, and this happens to varying degrees, but being gay is not being broken. Now, being gay and growing up in a community that constantly demonizes homosexuality could definitely lead to trauma, both sexual and otherwise, but again, I'd like to emphasize that it's the people who demonize homosexuality that are causing the trauma here, not the gayness of the gay person. All of us are. Heterosexual sin is just as much sin as homosexual sin is. Yet the difference here is that your religion provides an outlet for heterosexual sex, but insists that anyone that God made gay has to just do without sex for their entire lives. Number two, homosexuality is not the unpardonable sin. Oh good. How benevolent of you to point out that homosexuality isn't the absolute worst sin you could do. It's still bad, it's just not the worst. So. Good to know that God is willing to forgive gay people for being the way that he made them. Now, I'm no omniscient being by any stretch of the imagination, but it seems to me that the better course of action for God here would be to, you know, just not make gay people if being gay is a sin? Am I missing something? That seems perfectly reasonable and within God's capabilities, is it not? And the third point I make is, God loves us all. Yeah, he just doesn't love it when you act in accordance with the way that he made you. And the thing that I've encountered is um, this response from some people who struggle with this issue that homosexuality is almost a part of their identity. Mm -hmm. They don't view it as mm -hmm. something that's an element of brokenness in their life. They view it as all of them. Mm -hmm. So to reject that part of it or to view it as wrong is to view them as just mm -hmm. entirely broken. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, sexual orientation is a part of your identity. This goes for everyone, gay, bi, ace, straight, and everything in between. Our sexual preferences determine what kind of a person we end up making a life with, or even if we avoid pairing up entirely. That is a huge part of your identity, whether you recognize it or not. The ability to just go out in public with your partner or partners and be yourself without having to worry about other people passing judgment, making comments, trying to pretend that you don't exist, acting as though they are scared that you're a risk to their children. The ability to go out and just be yourself and not experience those things is a privilege. You would feel oppressed if any time you were out with your wife, the mere act of holding hands could lead to a confrontation with a stranger. You would feel belittled, like you had to pretend to be something that you are not while in public in order to avoid those uncomfortable moments. That is because a part of your identity is tied up in who you would or would not choose as your partner. And in my experience, straight people are actually a lot more fragile about their identity being tied to their sexuality than gay people are. Go ahead and test this out. Next time you're hanging out with a straight friend, just in insinuate that you think they seem like they might be gay, and watch as they bend over backward to prove that they aren't because they can't even tolerate the idea of someone thinking that they have a sexual orientation that they don't actually have. Now imagine that same person being told that they have to live the rest of their lives either celibate or as though they were actually gay even when they are not. Do you think they'd be able to do that? Or would that maybe, just maybe, violate a core part of their identity? 
It's the huge challenge. It really is between condemning and condoning. We don't want to condemn the person, but we don't, we don't want to condone that behavior which God forbids because it's harmful for them. You know, you can look at the depression rates. You can look at suicide rates. You can look at disease transmission rates. And I don't mean that to be unkind. Those are just facts. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Except the sin is a core part of the sinner's identity in this case, so hating the sin ends up being hate the sinner as well, pretty much automatically. And I knew it was only a matter of time before he brought up the higher instances of things like suicide and depression among LGBTQ people, so just take it back to either my eye color example or the color preference example. What do you think causes those people to have more mental health issues? Could it maybe be that there exist people like you sitting there pontificating about how they are broken sinners who deserve to be tortured for all of eternity for the crime of being the way that God made them? Because that's what the research says the cause is. Not in those words exactly, but that is what it breaks down to. Now, as far as disease transmission goes, it's more complicated, but it can also be traced back to homosexuality being considered a cultural taboo. If society says that being gay is wrong, then when it comes time for sex ed class, they're not going to teach how to have safe gay sex. Also, it's more than a bit of a red herring. If STI rates were actually a concern of yours, then you should be perfectly fine with lesbian couples, as lesbians have lower STI rates than any other category. And then of course there's the fact that I am grossly oversimplifying things here. There are other patterns associated with STI rates that take into account the fact that some people will self-identify as heterosexual, but will still engage in same-sex sex. And if you divide the groups up into categories of homosexual men who have sex with men, heterosexual men who have sex with men, weird sentence I know, bisexual men who have sex with men, homosexual men who have sex with men and women, heterosexual men who have sex with men and women, and it goes on, it hits all the categories, you get the idea. But when you look at STI rates with regards to both sexual behavior and self-identified sexual orientation, it turns out that the elevated STI risk is in gay and bisexual men who have sex with both men and women, rather than those who have sex exclusively with men or exclusively with women. So again, if you're actually using STI rates to justify calling certain sexual behaviors wrong, then it looks like being gay and straight are both fine, it's the bisexual men you want to watch out for. Well the men who have bisexual sex. Apparently a bunch of them will tell you that they're either gay or straight, even though they have bisexual sex. Bi erasure's a real thing, like, you can just be bi, it's okay. Bi people exist, it's real, just, just be bi. And actually, and this is just my speculation here, so take it with a grain of salt, but it seems like creating a cultural taboo on gay sex is what creates the scenario where you're more likely to end up with men who have sex with both men and women, but still tell you that they're straight. It's already happened historically. There have been plenty of gay men who married women, had kids with them, and had secret gay lovers when they could, and would tell you they were straight if you asked. And some would say, well, that's because we're homophobic. Well, we see some of those same issues in Denmark and Sweden and places where homosexual behavior has been accepted for decades, and there still are enormous issues that are just the other side of that. Now, when you bring other countries and cultures into the mix, things start to get complicated really quick. Ideally, in order to make a meaningful comparison between similar statistics in different countries, we would want to find one single study that looked at both countries, so that way we can make sure that there weren't methodological differences that created the appearance of correlation, or lack of correlation, without actually being causally linked. I cannot find such a study comparing the US with Sweden, but I did find a study that showed that in Sweden, homosexual men and women both had 1.8 times the likelihood of having experienced depression than their straight counterparts. A similar study in the US found that gay men had a 2.42 times the likelihood of having a major depressive episode in the last 12 months than their straight counterparts, and 1.33 times the likelihood for lesbians when compared to straight women. Before I dig into this any further though, just with these raw numbers, again, if you were actually concerned about such things, then you'd be asking why gay men in the US have such a higher likelihood of major depressive episodes in the last 12 months than any of the other groups. But if you're paying attention, you might have noticed that I switched from talking about those who have experienced depression in Sweden and those who have had a major depressive episode in the last 12 months in the United States. That's because the Swedish study measured depression with the Hopkins Symptom Checklist 25, which is a tool that's used to assess the likelihood of several mental health conditions, including depression, based on filling out their questionnaire. The American study, on the other hand, was looking at major depressive episodes, which is a period of acute depression that lasts for two weeks or longer in conjunction with some other symptoms. So when we take that into consideration, it's entirely possible, I'd even argue that it's likely, that LGBTQ people in the US have significantly higher rates of just general depression than those in Sweden. But at the end of the day, I was not able to find a conclusive answer to that question. 
But once again, if you actually cared about these things, you wouldn't just trot out the elevated mental illness rate among LGBTQ people in Sweden, as if that means conclusively that being LGBTQ is inherently bad for mental health. You'd be calling for more research. And then it comes right back around to the fact that sexual orientation is determined by biological factors before you are born. Knowing this, it is downright cruel to say that being LGBTQ is bad for your mental health, so just stop being LGBTQ. Rather, you should want to know why it is bad for mental health, and try to figure out ways to help make it better. After all, mental health can be affected by the same sorts of factors that affect sexual orientation, so it is possible that being LGBTQ does come with an inherently higher risk of mental illnesses like depression and anxiety, but the solution would not be to exacerbate the problem by adding minority stress into the mix. Like, Honestly, it's kind of gross that instead of looking into the actual issues, you just look far enough to find a negative statistic, and then assume that the only possible cause for that negative statistic is just being LGBTQ. No need to examine it further, the apologists have got it all figured out. Never mind that all of the psychologists, psychiatrists, neurologists, and any other brain-related ologist all agrees that this shit is way more complicated than that, and that intolerance of LGBTQ people is directly linked to the worse outcomes for LGBTQ people. But you know, we can just ignore all of that. Surely the guys who say that it's wrong based on the writings of an ancient culture that thought that period sex was a crime worthy of exile from the community are the ones who have it all figured out. And also, I didn't even bring up the fact that, you know, we live in a globalized society, so people in Sweden might be living in a culture that is more socially accepting of LGBTQ people, but they're still exposed to people like you who are dehumanizing them and trying to take their rights away in your country, so it's not like they're living in isolation over there. As unkind and intolerant as they may sound, those really just are the facts. No, those are not just the facts. Those are a very few oversimplified and cherry-picked facts that, when presented alone, completely misrepresent the actual facts and actual data. The person might say, I am gay, not just I'm attracted to men or I'm attracted to women or whatever the issue might be. And this is all of me, and so if you're telling me that God forbids this, you're really saying God forbids me, is what you're really telling me. What I'd want to say in response is that while that may be how they're experiencing life, that's not how God sees them. In other words, God doesn't see you for who you are. Who you are is not important to God. In order to please God, you have to become someone else. And you really wonder why depression and anxiety levels are higher among LGBTQ people. And that's basically it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Alexis Arnone, who says, This passage is widely acknowledged to be talking about Israel, aka the fig tree referenced in Hosea 9.10, and in Jeremiah 24. It's saying that the generation that sees Israel become a nation again, which happened on May 14th of 1948, will not pass away until all these things take place. This means that our Lord is likely returning soon. You know, I just love it when end times people get specific about this sort of thing. It's really fun to watch the goalposts shift as the prophecies continue to fail to come true. So according to this guy, Jesus is coming back before all the baby boomers are gone. So yeah, I hope to still be alive to see this prophecy fail. Thanks for watching! Don't forget to head to surfshark.deals slash rhino for 83% off a Surfshark subscription with three bonus months. Seriously, especially if you live in Texas right now, which is trying to limit what content is allowed to be shown to Texas internet users, look into HB2690, so you guys are going to need a VPN if that one passes. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, I am Tooth, Josh Marrow, Marlin357, and all the rest, who are the straight people who get married to avoid burning with the passion that is my channel. If you'd like nobody to ever suggest that you shouldn't marry even though the Bible explicitly tells you not to, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time! Hello, Puddles. Are you going to be Daddy's little clickbait? You can generate lots of clicks for Daddy. Yeah, yes, you are. Yeah, you look at the camera. You look at that camera. Show the people your cute little face. No, you're not going to generate clicks because I didn't put you in the thumbnail. Sorry, you don't feature enough in the video. You're just in the outtakes. Well, don't be mad. You'll get your chance to start them someday. You'll be a lead eventually. 
We're gonna make you famous. Boop. Okay, I'll put you. 120A, and do these things work if you snap them quietly? Because there's a dog down there that hates this thing, so. Is that okay? I think that was okay. She's happy with it. She didn't run away. No, she didn't. No, she didn't. I have work to do. I have to like stand up and actually talk to the camera now. Bye bye, puddles. There's a dog right there for some of this record. It can be a... Oh, are you lonely down there? You wanna say hi again? Can you say hi to the people again? You're gonna, you're gonna be all the outtakes today. You're the star of my outtake reel. Yeah, you are. We're not in focus. Anyway, hi. Well, all the poor podcast people are gonna have to go to YouTube to see my cute little puppy. That's my microphone. Don't lick it. Don't lick the microphone. Jeez. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. In fact, the evidence that color preference is biologically ter termined. Biologically termined. We're biologically termined color preference. It goes on. They get all, they get to all the categories there. God damn it. Might as well take a drink while it's down there.